Well, hi, everybody. I'm Don Stewart, and welcome to another edition of Your Bible Questions Answered. Today is Friday. It's the 2nd of February, 2024, and we're going to answer a question in this episode of Your Bible Questions Answered. That's one of the most often asked questions I've gotten over the years with respect to the Bible and Bible translations. Whenever we talk about the subject of Bible translation, this question always comes up, and it's real simple. Is the King James Version the best English translation to use for an English-speaking person as we study and read the Bible? Now, just to let you know, this answer is found in a book I've written called Bible Translations. It's on our website, Educating Our World, under the subject of the Bible. We have 12 different books on the subject of the Bible. This one's called Bible Translations, and it's question number 30 here. So you can print it out, download it, whatever you want to do with it, read it again. So I'm not going to read everything that we say in answering this question, but just enough so you get the gist of what's going on. All right. There are a number of people who believe that the King James Version is the only English translation a person should use. None others should even be consulted. Now, there's also the view that the King James Version is the best English translation to be used, but it's okay to consult others as long as you always go back to the King James Version to find out, you know, like the last word on certain issues. Now, there's other views that people have of the King James Version where they maybe prefer it, but they look at other translations. But what we're interested in now is that the question is this, is this the best English translation for us to use? And that's going to be the uh, question before us today. All right, first of all, I want to talk about the merits of the King James Version. They are many. First and foremost, it is a literary masterpiece. Nobody doubts that contains so many words and phrases that have become part and parcel of our English language, phrases that are still quoted to today. Nobody denies this. Second, history shows us that the King James Version helped unite the English-speaking world around this one particular translation of the Bible. In fact, for over 200 years, when the Bible was quoted in English, it was the King James Version that was cited. Millions of people have placed their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior through the reading and studying of the King James Version. Also, the translators did an excellent job. We should also note that the translators of the King James Version, or the authorized version as it's called in the UK, were godly men. They did an excellent job when we considered the limited tools in which they had to work at, with the at the time. All right, but here comes the however. However... There are several facts that we must take into consideration as we evaluate it in the 21st century. Fact number one, our knowledge has increased over the last four centuries. We are now four centuries beyond the translating the King James Version, and learning has certainly not stood still. Therefore, we will discover, through no fault of their own, that these translators were not as well equipped as modern translators are in translating the scriptures. In fact, it could not be otherwise because of the limited understanding of the times. Now, also fact number two, the King James translators themselves understood their work was not the last word on the subject. In fact, in the preface of the 1611 version, that's what they say. Uh, the King James version is it actually wasn't a new translation. It was a, a basic an update of the Bishop's Bible. And so the translators used the Bishop's Bible as much as they could in, in bringing this new tra or this new translation or updated translation to be. But they state in the preface, they're not the last word in any subject. Now, furthermore, when you look at the original uh, 1611 King James Version, you find over 8,000 marginal notes, which indicate alternative readings of the text. In addition, they made many intentional changes soon after the first edition was released. In the 1613 edition, there were 413 changes from the edition in 1611, just two years earlier. In 1629, the edition omitted the Old Testament Apocrypha. Yes, the Old Testament Apocrypha was printed in the original King James Version of 1611, and there was also an additional revision to the translation in 1629. Finally, in 1638, there were other revisions by two of the four people who were on the original committee. Now, what we're going to conclude is, it is not the best English translation today. We're not going to tell you to stop reading it. You just shouldn't make that your primary translation. And there's a number of reasons why. First of all, observation one, the understanding of Hebrew has greatly increased. The King James translators uh, use the Masoretic text, the same text that's used today, 
by translators of the Old Testament Hebrew scriptures, along with the Latin Vulgate, to translate the Old Testament. The problem in 1611 was the understanding of many Hebrew words. Today, this is not the case, and that leads us to observation two. There were no known similar languages or called cognate languages to Hebrew at the time the King James Version was translated. Simply put, in 1611, there was no knowledge of any of the ancient languages that are similar to Hebrew in which similar words and expressions could be compared. This created a problem because there are a number of Hebrew words that are found only once in the text of the New Testament. With no other ancient languages to compare to it, the translators had to make an educated guess as to the meaning of these words, and as we will discover, some of their guesses turned out to be inaccurate. Now, add to this the science of archaeology, the study of ancient debris of ancient civilizations had not yet been born. Consequently, there are many biblical references that were not understood by the translators. However, today we have a wealth of material from other languages similar to Hebrew, as well as further evidence from the discoveries of archaeology. In fact, modern translations have access to at least a dozen languages that are similar to Hebrew, where the words are used in these languages, and now we have a better understanding of what they mean. All of this has allowed modern translations into English to be more accurate and up-to-date. Indeed, we're still learning new things every day about the world of the Bible. Now, not only the Old Testament, the New Testament's the same. Observation three, advances have also been made in our understanding of Greek. With respect to the New Testament, in 1611, there was no knowledge of the Greek of the times of Jesus. Uh, the people who translated the King James were scholars. They were familiar with classical Greek, but they didn't know the common or Koine Greek that was the speaking uh, the, of everyday speech in the days of Jesus, uh, common Greek that was used in New Testament times. And in fact, it wasn't until the end of the 19th century that this was understood by scholars. So once it was understood, it actually revolutionized our understanding of the language of the Greek New Testament. Now, our fourth observation is the need for change has been recognized for some time. And this, there's been a couple of centuries that this has been the case, that the language of the King James Version needed to be updated. In fact, in about 1831, that's almost 200 years ago, Noah Webster, the famous lexicographer, cited one 150 words, 150 words that had changed their meaning in English since 1611. Since the authorized version was no longer communicating to the common person, Webster decided to correct these flaws. Now, again, what we're saying is not that the Bible needs to be changed or the Bible wasn't changed, the English language changed, and that's why it had to be updated. Now, here's the real issue. There's three categories of problem words that are found in the King James Version. Three main problems. There are English words that have become obsolete, word, and uh, words that are presently going out of use, and words that have changed their meaning since 1611. Let's look at each of these. First of all, words that are presently going out of use. There are a number of words that are found in the King James Version which are going out of use in modern English. Uh, many people today might still understand what these words mean, despite the fact that they are seldom, if ever, used in English today. So there's a lot of words we read we are somewhat familiar with it because, um, you know, we've heard it before, but they're ba basically going out of use. We don't use the words anymore in modern English. Number two is a much bigger problem. There are a number of obsolete words in the King James Version. While words that are going out of use do not cause a big problem with the modern reader, there are a number of words found in the King James Version that are no longer used in the English language, and these do cause a problem. We listed about 25 examples here. Let me give you some of them. Um, if there was a test, you'd have this word and you have you give five possible meanings. Uh, I think we'd all flunk it uh, because we don't know these words. Tabret, Genesis 31, 27, T-A-B-R-E-T, Blains, B-L-A-I-N-S, Exodus 9, 9, Coates, C-O-T-E-S, Exodus 30, uh, 35. Uh, skull, S-C-A-L-L, -L, Leviticus 13.30, when, W-E-N, Leviticus 22.22, crookbacked, Leviticus 21.20, and on and on we go from the Old Testament. I have the slightest idea what any of those words mean. I'm sure most of you don't either. But there are literally hundreds of these words in the King James Version where they're no longer in use in our English language. They've gone out of use. They're obsolete words. Same in the New Testament, charger, um, Matthew 14, 8, remember John the Baptist's head was brought to 
uh, Herod on a charger. Charger is just a plate or a plate, but charger is a, you know, it can mean a horse or a type of car or something like that today, or someone, uh, you know, football team uh, in the National Football League. Uh, glistening, Luke 9.29. Gl excuse me, glistering, not glistening like the sun, but glistering. Whist, Acts 12.9. Hoist, Acts 27.40. Froward, 1 Peter 2.18. I think you get the idea. These are words that we do not use anymore in the English language. The English language has changed in the last 400 years. They're not used. And again, most of us would be hard pressed to come to any type of meaning. So modern English speakers would not have the slightest idea what these words mean. In fact, they're incomprehensible to us today. But this isn't the major problem. Here is the big problem, the real problem with the King James Version today, using it as your main Bible. Hundreds of English words that are found in the King James Bible have actually changed their meaning. Now, words that are going out of use or words that are obsolete will certainly cause problems, but by far, this is the biggest problem. What we have here are words that actually have a different meaning today than what they meant in 1611. And sadly, when we read these words, we think the Bible is teaching one thing when it's saying something different because the same word that we use today has an entirely different meaning than 1611. Well, we've many examples, there's several hundred of them actually, but we'll give you a few of them here. We have them listed in the book. Target. Goliath had a target of brass between his shoulders. 1 Samuel 17, 6. It says he had greaves of, blast, of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. A target of brass. What's that sound like? Well, he had something, you know, target that they could shoot at uh, between his shoulders. Word target in 1611 meant javelin. He had a javelin between his shoulders. That's what it talks about. Okay, how about the mean men or the mean man? The authorized version uh, speaks of the mean men and the mean man. Proverbs 22, 29. Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. All right. In uh, Isaiah 2, 9. And the mean man boweth down, and the great man humbleth himself. Therefore, forgive them not. All right. The word does not refer to someone who's cruel or evil, but the word means the common man, not the mean man like we would use that today. A person's a mean man or a mean woman here. Cherish. Okay, the word cherish is talked about. King David, remember when he was um, getting old and they found a damsel that says to cherish him, uh, let him lie, uh, let her lie in thy bosom, let my lord the king may get heat. And the damsel was very fair and cherished the king and ministered to him, but the king knew her not. That's 1 Kings chapter 1 verses 2 and 4 from the King James Version. What does cherish mean? Well, in 1611, meant to keep warm. Doesn't mean that today. I just cherish this. Or I cherish that. We it has a whole different meaning here. Uh, brass, Second uh, Chronicles two seven. Send me now, therefore, a man cunning to work in gold and silver and brass and in iron and in purple and crimson and blue. Second Chronicles two seven. Well, brass was not known in the days of the, the Old Testament. Uh, the word means bronze. So that has a whole different meaning. Great and terrible. We read the following description of God in Nehemiah, the great and terrible God, Nehemiah 1.5. In 1611, the word terrible meant something that was full of awe. In other words, full of astonishment or wonderment. Today, of course, the word has the idea of something bad or something full of terror. Consequently, it means just the opposite today as what it originally meant. Now, we can go on and on. We have many, many, many other examples of this. In the New Testament, the word let in the King James Version, actually means to prevent. Uh, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he that now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. This is exactly uh, the opposite of what the word means today, permit or allow. Um, again, a totally different meaning. Wealth. Let no man seek his own wealth, but another man's wealth. We're supposed to seek another man's wealth? 1 Corinthians 10.24. In modern speak, speech, Wealth refers to riches. This verse seems to be advocating we seek after other people's money. However, in 1611, the English word wealth meant welfare, or to look after other people's welfare. All right. Um, on and on and on we go. I think you get the point here. There's many examples we have in the book. And so this is the problem that we have. When you read the King James Version, 
the English that's there will contain words either going out of use, words that are incomprehensible, totally obsolete, or the worst problem, words that we do understand, but have a total different meaning now than what they did in 1611, which will mean the passage that we read will have a total different meaning than what we think it means, because as we understand the word today, is not the way they understood it some four centuries ago. And it's for those reasons the King James Version is not the best translation for a person to read. Now, if you like, and no one's saying don't read the King James Version, if you like it, and you really want to stick with that, the New King James Version updates the word. So if you want to stick with the King James, New King James is a good translation, by the way. Um, that's a good one to use if you want to stick with that. But make sure, and here's the key, if you're going to read the King James Version, always read it with a modern translation, whether it be New King James, uh, NIV, New, New International Version, whether it be the uh, New Living Translation, the NLT, the Net Bible, New English Translation, the ESV, English Standard Bible. There's many out there. If you check the books I've written, like we've said, we read, use about 15 different English translations. They all do a good job. You know, and they, if you do any type of translation in any other language, you know, there's several ways you can say something and still get the thought across. And that's what these translations do. You compare them. If you have one of those parallel translation Bibles where you have four translations or eight translations, you read them. And if you do something like that, you're really going to get the idea of what the scriptures have to say, because some of them come at it, same thing, just a little bit differently. But the meaning comes out still the same. And so please, please avail yourself of these sources. Again, we're not going to say, or we're not saying anything disparaging about the King James Version, not at all. Just the fact is the English language has, has moved on from 1611, and we just don't talk like that anymore. And therefore, when we read the Bible in an archaic language, we're going to get the wrong impression many times, or no impression whatsoever when we haven't the slightest idea what a word means. So hopefully that helps. Again, it's question 30 in our book, Bible Translations. Is the King James Version the best English translation to use? No, it's, it's really not, because it doesn't bring the meaning across of what the scriptures originally said. We're not living in the 17th century now, and we have to have a translation that fits what we speak and how we speak in English in the 21st century. All right, I'm Don Stewart. Hope that helps. Until next time, may the Lord, as always, richly, richly bless.